Let us pray. Rescue the words, O God, that I will speak from the merely trivial, the purely occasional. Save what will be uttered from the purely pedantic, the merely pretty. Take now lips of clay and let them move at the impulses of your love. And if there are kudos, if there are compliments, let them go to Calvary. For it is in the sweet name of the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley, the Heart Fixer and the Mind Regulator, the Superintendent of the Resurrection, the Bridge Over Troubled Waters. It is in the sweet name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. I thank my dear friend, Dr. Kibble, for his generous words of introduction. Whenever I hear an introduction like that, I think of the words of the late Adlate Stevenson when he said, praise is like perfume. It's all right to smell it as long as you don't swallow it. <laughs> but I thank uh, Dr. Kibble for his generous words. I want to talk uh, about the Christian contribution to urban ministry. The Christian contribution to urban ministry. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, reading verses 13 through 16, the contemporary English version of the Bible, we find this word from the Lord, Matthew 5, beginning with verse 13. You are like salt for everyone on earth. But if salt no longer tastes like salt, how can it make food salty? All it is good for is to be thrown out and walked on. You are like lights, like light for the whole world. A city built on top of a hill cannot be hidden. And no one would light a lamp and put it under a clay pot. A lamp is placed on a lampstand where it can give light to everyone in the house. Make your light shine so that others will see the good that you do and will praise your Father in heaven. The Christian contribution to urban ministry. There are a multiplicity of forces competing for the soul of our cities. There is one increasing pluralism, both racial and religious. A few days ago, I had a, a Hindu priest pray in the Senate, and it became a cause celeb for those who have not read the Establishment Clause to the First Amendment of the Constitution, uh, that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. But we, we live in an environment of increasing pluralism, both racially and religiously. Our cities don't look the same as they did even 10 or 15 years ago. 
On Capitol Hill now, they are dealing with immigration issues because our cities don't look the same. I was invited to a Ramadan Ishtar, the ending of the fast for uh, Muslims at the Pentagon dining room. The Pentagon dining room will uh, seat about 300 people. And I expected that there would be 10 or 15 uh, military people who were Muslim. And I was astonished when I walked into the Pentagon and down to the dining room that there was standing room only. Muslim military personnel. There are forces competing for the souls of our cities. And someone has given the definition of insanity. If we keep doing the same thing, expecting different results, that's crazy. Another force that we must deal with is Christian secularism. The fact of the matter is that the data show that uh, Christians have a similar pathology as non-Christians. There used to be a time we would say the family that prays together stays together, but now Christian marriages, if you believe the statistics, are breaking up as frequently and in some areas more frequently than non-Christian marriages. <coughs> Christians are involved in moral and ethical lapses so that when they are caught, they say, well, I, I've confessed it <laughs> to my priest or whatever they might have to say, but these are folk who claim to be followers of our blessed Lord. Uh, but there is a Christian secularism competing for the souls of our cities. Yeah. And then there is, there is a hedonism, a thirst for pleasure, and the ability to get it in a way that when I was coming up, you couldn't get it. If you wanted to get in trouble when I was coming up, you had to work at it. I mean, you, you, you really had to work at it. I mean, you had to go five miles down the road, jump over the fence, and knock on the door and give the password. But today, that child right upstairs with a Bible verse on the bedroom door can have the most lurid pornography piped into that room. And if parents are not vigilant, they will discover that the enemy is right in their home. And there is a hedonism because young people today now know, many of them, that they will not be able to approximate the income of their parents. I mean, I feel for these kids. I've got three sons and just trying to get into the real estate market with prices like these. Very difficult to do. And so many of them go for pleasure because who knows what tomorrow will hold. A corollary of that is the force of materialism. Every time you turn on the television, somebody is trying to sell something. And people are beginning more and more today to believe that their lives consist in the abundance of the things that they possess and that those who have the most toys at the end of life win. The reality is materialism competes for the souls, the soul of our cities. And then there is ancient religions. People are dusting off old heresies and bringing them back disguised as, as New Age philosophies, modern religious cults. These are some of the forces that those of us who seek to minister to our cities 
must deal with. Christians are not the only ones trying to make a difference in our cities. I travel about with senators to talk to people about faith-based initiative money and to inform clergy persons about monies that are available that they don't even know anything about. So government is trying to make an impact, almost like an urban ministry. Psychologists are trying to make impacts, and you've got 12-step programs, not just for alcoholism, but for sexual addiction, and, and all kinds of sensitivity groups trying to do what the church used to do, and what many times the church is neglecting to do. And nature abhors a vacuum. And so I want to talk about the Christian contribution to urban ministry because that contribution is not what happens in worship services. I tell people wherever I go, it is when the worship ends that the service begins. The New Testament word for church is ecclesia, the called out ones. Your church is not that building on a certain corner in a certain area. Your church, if it is functioning the way our Savior wants it to function, your church is on the metro during the week. Your church is in Walmart Amen. during the week. Amen. Your church is in Walgreen during the week. Your, your church is in the stadiums. Your church is permeating and penetrating non-Christian society. Now, ready or not, unless our Lord uh, comes, each of us will have a funeral. Few people have gotten out of this life alive. Uh, Enoch pulled it off. According to Hebrews 11, one day he and God took one of their usual walks, and, and I'm told that God turned to him and said, well, it looks like my house is closer than your house, so why don't you just come on home with me? Uh, Elijah... He, he got out alive with a fiery chariot, and he had his little protege, Elisha, with him. And, and he said, boy, you, you, you've been really good to me. You've been pouring water on my hands before I eat. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, can I do something for you? Because God has given me uh, an intuition that it won't be long before I'll be leaving here. He no doubt expected for Elisha to ask for uh, one of the pulpit robes that he used on a regular basis or special Bible that he used uh, uh, that he was fond of or some special sermon notes. But the young man shocked him by saying, you are a very powerful man and I want twice the Holy Ghost you got. Lord have mercy. Yeah. The prophet says, your son, you've asked the hard thing. I, 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 I give you my chariot, I give you my cloak, but you, you've asked a hard thing. Oh, God, help us to start asking for some hard things. Help us to stretch omnipotence. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said, some people see things that are and ask why. Others dream things that never were and ask why not. Oh God, help us to start asking why not as we dream things that never were. I feel something pushing me here. Oh, I feel God in this place. Uh, and so Elisha received double the anointing. Now, in scripture, Elijah performed 14 bona fide miracles. Elisha performed 27, and then he died. 
And there were some scholars who said, I thought he had twice the Holy Ghost, but 14 and 14 in 27 is 28, and he's dead now, and we've counted it over and over again, and there's only 27, but while he was dead. Uh, somebody better come get me. I feel like misbehaving. While he was dead, uh, one of the enemy soldiers uh, panicked and grabbed one of his slain colleagues and tossed him in the sepulcher of the dead prophet. Yeah, and there was enough of the power of the Holy Ghost still in his dead bones to raise the dead. I wish I could get some help up in here. I'm not, y'all, y'all not going to help me today. Hey, uh, number 28. Posthumously, but number 28. I want such an anointing on my life that even when you bury me, I still got power. The Bible says Abel, even being dead, he's still talking to us. That's what we need if we're going to make a Christian contribution to urban ministry. This is not the government's job. Uh-uh. No, 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 not if you love Jesus. That's my job. Hallelujah. I went, when I went to the Senate, they, they said, now, chaplain, we, we know that uh, you are Seventh-day Adventist. They said, what do Seventh-day Adventists believe? I said, well, Seventh-day Adventists can say a fervent amen to every aspect of the Apostles' Creed. I knew I knew I was talking to Presbyterians on the selection committee. And so one of them looked at the other, raised his eyebrow as if to say, now what does an Adventist know about the Apostles' Creed? And then, and this is a good Presbyterian, then he looks at me as if he doesn't know what, and he says, Apostles' Creed? And I said, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and they all broke out laughing. <laughs> that, that, that's enough, that's enough. You, you, you know the creed. He said, well, well, well we, we, just, we, we just wanted to make an offer to you because you may not want to give Bible studies. I said, giving Bible studies is my job. Amen. That, that's what I do. And we need, as we look at urban ministry, to recognize that that's our job. And, and, and when it comes that day when someone stands up and says, our brother has passed on. Here he is, sleeping in Jesus. I don't want God to say that my life really didn't count when it came to touching the cities. Jesus wept over the city. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killeth the prophets and stoneth them which are sent of God, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathereth of her brood, but you would not. Do you have the same compassion as our Lord did over the city? Uh, I believe he's still weeping over the cities. Now, if we're going to make the Christian contribution, and if our lives will count for eternity and not just for time, there are only two things that we need to do according to our scripture lesson, and that is to be salt and to be light. Jesus said, if you can be salt and light, you will be making the Christian contribution to urban ministry. Let others come up with newfangled programs, but the word of God is solid. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Now, how do we energize ourselves and those whom we seek to mobilize for ministry to be salt and light? One, we must teach people to flavor our world. You see, salt Seasons, salt flavors, flavor your world. Okay? Br 
bring flavor to your world. Now, what am I talking about? Yeah, you, you can't be from the north and understand this, but those of you from the south ought to understand it. Think of grits without salt. I, I shudder. I, 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 I just shudder. When I, when I, I just saying it just makes, me, just makes me tremble. Grits without, that's a, that's a terrible thing, isn't that? that, that that's, a, that's a form of torture. Make a man eat grits without salt. Think, think of gravy. No salt in, oh Lord, no, no, in, no salt in gravy. Oh, how desperately we need to bring flavor to our world. That's my first point. Bring some flavor to your world. Now, Ellen White says, if we were only kind, she's not talking about theological training, not talking about an extra Congress. She said, if you, we were only kind, there would be 100 where there's only one. You see, kind people bring flavor to their world. Uh, growing up in Berea, we had some sisters who knew how to bring some flavor. I tell you, sometimes we go to church hungry. And uh, when I was growing up in the hood, we did some involuntary fasting. <laughs> Y'all don't know about that. Y'all don't know about the involuntary fasting. Mama would announce on Friday, children, we're going to be fasting today. Now, voluntary fasting is good for the soul. But that involuntary stuff will, de will break your spirit. And then we'd go to church and Mama would say, and you better not let anybody know you're hungry. We'd be walking in like hostages, <laughs> trying to signal with our eyes that this woman behind us is going to kill us if we let you know the truth. And people be talking about happy Sabbath. You know, happy Sabbath to nobody. And you hungry, boy, you know, the Lord is good. And they wonder why we weren't coming back with no all the time, because we were wondering how come we weren't eating. And there were there were sisters every Sabbath would invite my mama and her five piranha. I mean, you, you, you invited Pearlene's children home. You were asking for trouble. Home. Now, my mother would drill us. Now, children, we're going over to Sister Lewis's house. That Sister Clara Lewis, you're talking about, she, could, she had this gluten that she made out of whole wheat flour. First time I lifted holy hands in my life was eating <laughs> Lord have mercy. Some good food. And you see, they made macaroni and cheese with the government cheese. <laughs> see, you, you, you haven't had macaroni and cheese. See, Kraft ain't got nothing, but, but I ain't even gonna go there, because y'all, uh, I, I can't get no help in here. But y'all know the best grilled cheese sandwiches you will ever have come from that government cheese. I wish they'd sell it. I'd buy that government cheese if they'd sell it. I tell you, praise the Lord. And my, and my mother would drill us. She'd say, now children, if Sister Lewis says, if Sister Lewis says, she'd, oh, I want you to listen to me, look at my eyes now. If Sister Lewis says, have you had enough? What is your response? And we were like a voice cry. Yes, ma'am, we have had enough. And I said, now here's another one, children. Just, just sit right now. Now, what if Sister Lewis says, she comes out of the kitchen, and she's not going to say, have you had enough, but she says, is there anything else I can do for you? What is your response? And, and we knew it wasn't yes, ma'am. Then it was, no, ma'am, we are fine. I tell you, we'd walk into Sister Claire Lewis's house or Sister Ada Thornton or Sister Ethel Cox, and boy, that, that smell of that macaroni and cheese would hit me. Weaken the knees. I staggered in my chair. And I knew in my home that judgment was swift and certain. Because mama wouldn't even wait for you to get home. You, you, you broke one of her commandments and you got it right there in the house. Sister Lewis came out and said, can I get you anything else? 
And I knew what the consequences would be. But I was willing to take the pain. Yes, 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 yes. Thank God for the people who bring flavor to our world. See, that's urban ministry. See, we've got we've to help people see when you are dealing with the marginalized, when you are dealing with the least of these. You're doing urban ministry. I'm a preacher today, not because of the great pastors I had at Berea Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church, but because of Ada Thornton, Clara Lewis, Mildred Moore, a, a host of sisters who were doing ministry by bringing flavor to my world. Used to let me scrub the little white steps in Baltimore. Give me 25 cents, big money in those days. Because they knew that by giving me some, some shekels for my pocket, that it would keep me away from the gangs who would say, we can help you get some money. Yes. We've got to help people to see ministry in the trenches, not just where they're being recognized. Because a lot of that ministry, in the words of, in the vocabulary of my childhood, is fronting. Fronting, pretending to be something that you're not. I, I, I was to, to preach at a, when I was in my 20s, was to preach at a pastor's church, and he was a centurion every year, and I was very excited uh, to preach at the church in, 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 in the conference, and I was getting all ready for a huge congregation in the church, and I'd done the calculation just while I was there. He had baptized over 500 people. I'm ready to go to this great urban center. And I go to the church, and there, there, there aren't even 100 people in the congregation. Because here was an individual applauded for his ability to fish for men and women, but he wasn't keeping the aquarium. And the people were not there. And I thought to myself, someone seeing the stats would say, now this is what I'm talking about in terms of urban ministry. But God doesn't look at it like that. He sees how we're bringing flavor to those who will perish without our attention and our care. And one by one, you can so connect with individual lives when you recognize that you are salt, that you will begin to see fruit as young people leave and make a mark for Christ. Every soul that I have ever baptized, and God has blessed me to baptize hundreds, every soul that I have ever baptized Sister Lewis and Ethel Cox and Ada Thornton and Albertha Brown, they have made a contribution to that. They have made a contribution to urban ministry. And then the second thing that we must help people first to bring flavor to your world is to work to preserve our world. I believe that our society is surviving today because of the saints. I'm afraid of what America would look like if there were no Christians, if there were no intercessors, if there were no people sighing and crying for the city. And you've got to recognize that salt preserves. In Jesus' time, it, it was before refrigeration, and they'd rub salt to slow the decay of the meat. Salt preserves. Jesus says that we should be a vehicle of preservation for our cities. And one of the best ways of doing that is to recognize the proof of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 
Verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty unto God to the pulling down of strongholds. We've got to begin to become aggressive in using our spiritual weapons. For Ephesians 6 has it right, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And we need spiritual weapons. What are some of these weapons? Oh, how desperately we need more and more to use the weapon of prayer. Tennyson said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. James 5.16 says, the effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. James 5.17 says, Elijah was a human being like us. And yet this man, through the power of importunate prayer, shut up the heavens for three and a half years. There's power in prayer. Uh, you remember in Genesis 18, when God paid a visit to Abraham, talked to him in such a way that Sarah started laughing. The <laughs> Lord said that this woman pushing 90 was going to have a baby. She just started laughing. The Lord said, why'd you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, yeah, you did. You laughed. You laughed. <laughs> Thank God for his mercy. See, Ananias and Sapphira didn't get that kind of mercy. <laughs> yeah, they lied, and that, but that was the end of it, you know. You know, lesson for Ananias and Sapphira. If you come in and the preacher asks you a question and your spouse is not in her usual place, you better tell the truth. There's that no time to lie. When you don't see, that should have been a tip-off for one of them. Where am I? Yeah, but, but my sisters and my brothers, God said to, uh, to his, the angelic creatures that were with him, we, we can't keep this from Abraham. Got to tell him we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and you know the story. Abraham said, are you going to destroy the righteous with the guilty, the innocent with the guilty? What about 50? The Lord said, no problem, 50. Well, I, did I say 50? I, I meant 45. No problem. The Lord, don't get angry with me. And he worked his way down the scale until he said 10. I wish he'd kept going. <laughs> God said, for the sake of 10. Ten righteous people would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you don't understand what I'm saying, because we got significantly more than ten in here. Sodom and Gomorrah was so bad that when the visitors entered Lot's house and Lot made the great feast, Genesis chapter 19, the Bible says all of the men of the city, young and old, now, now you, 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 you're talking about young fools and old fools came seeking to satisfy their lust with these visitors. Billy Graham once said that if God doesn't judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot. Because oriental hospitality required it almost, the protection of the stranger that is within your gate. Begged them and in desperation said, I've got two daughters, never known a man. And these men were so in the grip of their pathology. Oh, we, don't, we, we, we don't want any women, we want those men. And we'll, we'll work you over. If nothing, you, who is this judge that's come among us? Genesis chapter 19. These powerful heavenly beings, that's what you're dealing with when you, you know, one angel killed 185,000 soldiers, right. and, the, and, the, and the word is he was a junior angel because if God had sent a senior angel, it would have destroyed the world. Uh, look for somebody who just, just, just wants somebody, not a whole lot of damage, just 185,000. That's all we want. I don't want to kill everybody in the world. The angel stretched forth his hand and pulled Lot back and smote these men with blindness. Now this is the thing, this is the thing that really, Genesis 19, 11. Here you are smitten with supernatural blindness. Now let me tell you, I don't care what my lust is, you turn out the light supernaturally, it's time for me to go home. I, 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 I don't care who, I don't care what I want or what, could, could somebody help me get home because I, I think it's time for me to go home. These folk, Genesis 19, 11, the Bible says 
they wearied themselves trying to find the door. Supernaturally smitten with blindness. That's the kind of sickness you have in the city that even when there is a move of God's judgment, folk don't even know it. They still continue in their pathology. And yet for the sake of 10, God would have spared that city. There are people in, on Capitol Hill who are retired and they get up early every morning and all they do is walk through and around the Capitol praying, interceding for the nation, interceding. That's their full-time job of intercession. Great God from Zion. They say a plane went down in Pennsylvania, and most of the experts say that that plane, uh, they believe, was headed for the Capitol. Yes. Could it be that for the sake of 10? Yes. Oh, I feel God in this place. Could, could it be that for the sake of five, yes. sighing and crying, yes. God spared that place. God spared the legislative branch. Oh, we need, to, we, need to, we need to fast and pray. Some of this stuff doesn't come out but by fasting and prayer. Mark chapter 9. Use the weapon of prayer. Then use the weapon of a good example. <laughs> what you do speak so loudly, people can't hear what you say. Edgar Guest put it this way, I soon can learn to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lectures you deliver may be ever wise and true, but I'd rather get my message by observing what you do. Example, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be sufficient evidence to convict? The way you conduct yourself in rush hour traffic, Say ouch if you can't say amen. You know how it is. You, uh, you know, may not have it in Huntsville, but in D.C., you got some crazy people driving. You got some homicidal folk driving. And let me tell you, when the adrenaline is pumping, particularly when you are aboard from the hood, see, you are multilingual. <laughs> Lord have mercy. And it's not just Ebonics, either. You got some stuff. It better be buried and covered by the blood. But I tell you, sometimes in that car is resurrection time. Now some of this stuff will, will resurrect itself. But you got to live the life. Because that ultimately is what people will look at. And then the, a third weapon is evangelism. Each one can reach one. The Great Commission is for the ecclesia, the called out ones. And, and, and the problem is, Jesus said, go and make disciples, and we are making members. And there's a difference between a member and a disciple. If you're going to make a Christian contribution to urban ministry, you've got to make disciples. People who love Jesus. People who have been mentored to obey not just the Seventh-day Sabbath, but the Sermon on the Mount. That's some tough stuff there, folks. If he compels you to go one mile, go with him twain. <laughs> Jesus says, I'm not so concerned about you going to embassy suites with somebody that you shouldn't be at. I don't even want you lusting in your heart. I'm not concerned with you getting an AK-47 and shooting somebody. I don't want you hating anybody. Yeah. Love your enemies. Yeah. Bless those who curse you. That's making disciples. Pray for those who despitefully you, you. If we're going to preserve our world, we've got, to, we've got to use the weapon of evangelism. And then we need fourth weapon, the weapon of persuasion. We need Christian apologists, individuals who can make a case 
for Christianity without using scripture sometimes. Like Dr. Collins, who's doing amazing work for Christianity. He's heading this DNA project and speaking all over America and the world. What an amazing human being. He just looks at <laughs> DNA and he can preach Christ from DNA. We need folk who are trained in our best schools, who like C.S. Lewis can take on detractors of our faith. We need some Apostle Paul, you know? God can use Peter, but when it came to writing most of the New Testament, God said, hey, thank you, Pete. We appreciate what you're doing. This is good work. You keep on preaching. But this is Paul's job. Got to put him in jail to get him to do it. But this is, this is Paul's job. Amen. Need people who can persuade. And then there's a fifth weapon if we're going to preserve our world, and that is the weapon of suffering. Martin King put it this way, undeserved suffering is redemptive. Matthew 16, 24 says, if anyone would come after me, let him or her deny self, take up his or her cross and follow me. Are you willing to lose your life for Christ's sake? I can't go in that area. That's a rough area, child. I, 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 you know, we, we got to get some help. I don't know. Are you willing to make sacrifices? That good Samaritan was willing to suffer, wasn't he? Amen. Uh, you know, I got to be honest. I probably, <laughs> hey, that, that guy may be faking. I, I know those tricks. I'm a boy from the hood. I'm not going to go over there and have his buddies jump out. You know, I'm not going to take the bait. But if you're going to make the Christian contribution to urban ministry, you're going to have to be willing to suffer. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, all those who live godly will suffer persecution. And so my sisters and brothers, the Christian contribution involves bringing flavor. The Christian contribution involves preserving. The Christian contribution involves penetrating non-Christian society. That's the third. Penetrating non-Christian society. Away with these false pyramids of Christian vocations. You're not a Christian unless you're a preacher. You're not a Christian unless you are a medical missionary. You're not a Christian unless you are a professor in one of our schools. The schools of the prophets. Salt's got to penetrate. You ever heard, ha, eaten something and it's got a lump of salt that really didn't penetrate the food like it should? You got that thing in your mouth. Oh, oh wow, that's terrible, you know. That's what happens when salt does not penetrate. We need Christian athletes. I'd love to see an Adventist Eric Liddell who gets the Sabbath right this time Amen. and says, no, I'm not going, I'll run on Sunday, <laughs> but I'm not going to run from sunset Friday oh, to yes. sunset Saturday. Oh, yes. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see a Christian professor at Harvard bringing a different world view, bringing revelation as he makes his presentations. We need Christian Politicians, God knows we need Christian politicians. The issues that they grapple with can affect the nation and the world. And I'm so glad to report that every week I have a Bible study just for the senators, and they're there. Every week I have a Bible study just for the spouses of the senators, and they're there. Every week I have a prayer breakfast just for the senators, and they're there, 30, 35 of them, there. Praise God. I did a series on end-time events. Most of them had never even heard of Daniel 2. I said, I'm going to give you a little world history lesson. I worked with the head of gold and the chest of silver and the 
belly and thighs of brass, and I'm working with it. They never heard. This was new light to most of them. <laughs> Calm down. Advent has been teaching this stuff for years, but you're going to get it. I had one senator ask me, Chaplain, is, is global annihilation a possibility according to scripture? Uh, I said, my brother, didn't you, didn't you hear me tell you about that stone? <laughs> you, don't you remember the stone that came out of the moment? God's not going to let terrorists take down his planet. Oh, no, 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 no. It's going to be taken down, but it won't be by terrorists. Right. Hallelujah. Stone's going to smite the image. Yes. The feet of iron and clay, that's where we are right now. Yes. Weak and divided, soon to pass away. That stone is going to fill the earth until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Oh, my sisters and my brothers, that's penetrating. Non-Christian society, Wilberforce, Felt the call to the ministry, talked to his pastor Newton, talked to his friend Pitt. I feel like I ought to go into the ministry. And Pitt convinced him, hey, there's a ministry in politics. There's a ministry in parliament. You need to penetrate. And Wilberforce became a member of parliament and year after year inveighed against the slave trade. Got to abolish the slave trade. And the votes were so lopsided, folk were laughing at him. But year after year, until more than a decade went by, and one wag said, Every year in England, it is certain that two things will happen. One, spring will come, and two, Wilberforce will speak out against the slave trade. For this born again, fire baptized believer, a covert agent of Jesus Christ in Parliament, kept on speaking out against the slave trade until year 20. He got what he had been asking for. And Great Britain abolished the slave trade even while slavery was still going on in America because Wilberforce had penetrated non-Christian society. If you're going to make a Christian contribution to urban ministry, you gotta, you got to lighten up a little bit and start getting to know the people whom you will seek to win for Christ. T.D. Jakes, who has one of the largest and fastest growing churches, the Potter's House, he said when he, when he got to Dallas from West Virginia, he went downtown to the gut of the city. He saw the drugs and the nightclubs and the prostitutes and all of that. And by God's grace, he began to pray to come up with a strategy for taking Dallas for the Lord Jesus Christ. And hundreds of the people in the Potter's house today are former felons, prostitutes, pimps. He brought them in. He cleaned them up. He, he got uh, barber shops and, and places where they could work, actually created businesses because they were having problems getting jobs. He had clothes for them to put on so that when the cameras came on, you couldn't tell where they had been only a couple of weeks. He, he took that city yes. by penetrating it. Listening to its heartbeat and claiming it for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, look, I, he said, I don't have to steal your members. He said, there are enough sinners out there to go around. We out there, you know, we're doing it the old fashioned. Well, let's go over to those Baptist churches and let's sit in their Sunday schools and maybe we'll be there are enough, there are enough hurting people in our world who desperately need saving that we don't need to be stealing somebody else's sheep right now. Uh, and if they wander away from the fold and stumble into your place, well, that's another story. But the point is, 
Pick up one in your hand, that's another story. But the point is, enough folk out there. And then finally, if you're going to make a Christian ministry, a Christian contribution to urban ministry, you must not only bring flavor, you must not only preserve, you must not only penetrate, but you must illuminate your world. Let your light shine so that others will see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Uh, I call it the private detective test. Daniel, one of my heroes, uh, an empire fell. Daniel was still at the top of his game. The Medo-Persian Empire arose, and there was Daniel, and there was the envy and the jealousy, and they said, well, put some private detectives on. Everybody's got some skeletons in their closet. You follow him around, tap his phone, and follow, see where he goes, and we, we'll get enough dirt on him to embarrass him. We'll tell him, you know, this is what we know about you now. If you don't resign, and, and they followed him around. Daniel chapter 6. Now, be honest. If, if your enemies, if your detractors followed you around, what would their final testimony and evaluation be about you? I'm talking about when you get behind closed doors. Yeah, you're all, all looking sanctified now, but when you, when you get behind closed doors. Listen to this tribute from Daniel's enemies. Daniel chapter 6, verse 5. We cannot find anything against this Daniel. Amen. Except it be concerning the law of his God. If you're going to take him out, it's got to be on religious grounds. Because that is how consistent. Never do anything in private that would make you blush if it were made public. You've got to be a guide. You've got to illuminate. Light illuminates without saying anything. I was in an airport, and uh, I'm in an airport a lot, a lot more often than I like to be. You know, uh, the Bible says, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. I just don't <laughs> like to be up there. And uh, particularly when I see someone who is not dressed in Western attire, the adrenaline starts pumping. And I don't believe in racial profiling, but I got to be honest, the adrenaline starts pumping. And I usually would turn to a seat man and say, now look, if he gets up at any point, Tell you what, I'll take the top, you take the bottom. You know, I, I mean, you, you know, you, you just can't be too careful. So I was there in the airport, and this sister came through, and she was dressed in Islamic, Mideastern attire that I've seen in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and a few of the places I went. And, and uh, y you know, although they say the search is random, those folk always get searched, the special search. Everybody else walking through. And here she's supposed to be coming through the random search. She got all this stuff on and, uh, and uh, ding, 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 ding. You will go over there, please. <laughs> so she go, I mean, the, the machine didn't even go off, but she still had to go on over there, you know. And I mean, they were searching, girlfriend. I, they were searching her. I, and I stood there astonished, not with the thoroughness of the search, but with the serenity on her countenance. She had a smile on her face and she, I mean, it was like a walk in the park, and all of a sudden, I felt something in my spirit. I said, she can't be Muslim. She's got to be a Christian dealing with this thing like that. And so even though I was in a hurry, I waited around, and she left the, the thing finally and was on her way, and I came alongside her, and I said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And she turned with a beautiful smile, and she said, how did you know? Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel 
when necessary, use words. Ah, oh, my sisters and brothers, we are to illuminate the darkness with our lives. You got folk. I, I, I was going to the 50th anniversary of this church to preach, and I couldn't find it. I stopped, asked somebody, you know where this church is? And they didn't know. Drove some more, stopped, you know where this church is? And they didn't know. Then I saw three people sitting on the steps of uh, one of these neighborhood stores, and I asked them, did they know where the church was? They didn't know, and I drove a half a block, and there was the church, <laughs> celebrating its 50th and this was in the hood. This was in the inner city. And three people a half a block from the church with the folk just praising the Lord and having a good time, congratulating the pastor, and three folk don't even know that your church exists. You got to illuminate the dark. Matthew 25, God is not going to congratulate you on how many people you convince about the validity of his Sabbath. God is not going to congratulate you on how many vegetarians you've made. God is not going to congratulate you on how many women you've convinced not to use makeup anymore and God knows in a sinful world, some of them could use a little makeup. Yeah. You know, uh, we got a standard, a pre eating standard, you know? <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Antediluvian standard, but it, this is a sinful world now. You, 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 you patch it up any kind of way you can these days. Lord have mercy. But in that great day, we're talking urban ministry here. He's going to want to know where you're salt, where you're light. Did you bring flavor to your world? Did you stand in the gap and preserve your world? Did you keep the angels holding back the winds just a little longer? Did you penetrate your world? Or did you just go in the huddle each Sabbath, and each Wednesday night, okay, we got margin order, see you next huddle. Forgetting that the purpose of the huddle is to help you play the game. And are you illuminating the darkness with your light? Ellen White, there is no limit she says, to the usefulness of one, hallelujah, who put himself aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit in his or her life, and lives a life wholly dedicated to God. Jonathan Edwards was one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. When he was 17 years old, he sat down and he wrote 21 resolutions amazing resolutions. By the end of his life, he had written over 70 resolutions, which he read over each day. Google Jonathan Edwards' resolutions, and you can get all 70 of them. Resolution number one was resolve that whatever action I take, it will be for the glory of God. Resolution number seven is Resolve to not engage in any action or activity that I would not want to be doing if I knew this was the last hour of my life. And then I don't know the number of the resolution, but it says this. Resolve that if there can be only one human being that God can select from the entire planet Earth who pleases him. Resolve to be that one. Lord have mercy. My sisters and brothers, if 
By God's grace, it is time to become salt. Let's bring some flavor. Let's preserve. Let's stop the decay. Let's penetrate the unchristian society. Away with these little enclaves, this provincialism, this, well, if you go into the military, you're leaving the ministry. <coughs> How myopic. And let's, by God's grace, permit him to make us a blessing in these challenging days in which we live. But the challenge, uh, as we begin this great conference, make a Christian contribution to urban ministry. Don't let the government do more than you're doing. Amen. Because there's some things you can do that no governmental institution, no psychological institution, no sociologist coming into the area can do. By God's grace, you can be salt and you can be light.